So that was an Andantino number 30 from Giuliani's Opus 50. And follow the lesson for free. We're going to be talking about some right-hand fingering issues in this particular piece and the texture in general. Uh, but if you're interested, I do have an edition of all 32 works in Opus 50, and there's a link for that in the description. So as with number 29, there's some this, this piece is, is fairly straightforward in terms of what to do with it, but there's some right-hand fingering issues to, to definitely talk about in this particular case. The, the important thing is this, is that even if, like, it's very difficult to follow the right-hand fingering in a piece like this. Trying to read the right-hand fingering is very difficult. However, if, you have, if you're following a concept of fingering, it's going to be much easier and you can put that concept into the muscle memory of your hand and, and to some extent work the piece on automatic pilot. So regardless of whether you use um, spe the specific upper fingerings that I use in this piece, um, the lower fingering is the important concept fingering that you want to pay attention to. So we have a basic two-voice texture here, like the previous piece, and with an Alberti bass figure, and that accompaniment figure is a very popular classical era figure on the piano. It's you know that's happening in the left hand while the right hand does melody. On the guitar, this is happening as accompaniment, while melody is happening. On top of that, which is much more difficult on the on the guitar than on the piano. So, like I said, the, the the right hand fingering is complicated. However, the accompaniment fingering is not. So, the first thing you want to do is understand that PI is the concept of fingering that's being used for the Alberti bass. So. That lower voice is just P-I-P-I -P -I the whole time. Couldn't be simpler, right? So what you want to do is to be able to feel that while adding in the other fingers. But it's so disruptive when the, the melody is, you know, sometimes in 16th notes. So uh, my recommendation is to play around with the accompaniment first. You know, and then just start, like you can take that first quarter note beat and just loop it and start adding in the upper notes. In this particular piece, I've chosen to um, alternate fingers in the upper voice. The previous one I didn't, but on this one I did. And uh, you have to choose some kind of fingering. You could repeat fingers in the upper voice. You know, and regulate the A finger to the B string and the M finger to the G string. That is fine. That's in, it's not a fast tempo. If you want to just repeat fingers in the upper voice, I think that's acceptable in this particular case because uh, that can simplify the fingering. I had to choose something, so I decided to go with alternating ones for this one. On the previous piece, I did repeated fingers. I'll leave it up to you. But that accompaniment finger figure of PI, it's very important that you do maintain that because, you know, once you get out of the first measure, then it continues and you, you want there to be some continuity in your fingering there. And also because you're trying to control the texture, that melody wants to be very prominent and the accompaniment wants to be a little bit softer and just rolling along um, without any interruptions. And in this piece, it could be very interrupted by the complexity of the fingering there. The piece itself is not that difficult. There's nothing particularly difficult, difficult about the piece. The le left hand fingering is fairly easy. It's not even very fast in the right hand. It's just that you have to make sure that your muscle memory understands what it's trying to do here. So I go M, A, M. Again, it doesn't really matter what fingers you use for the upper voice, but I want you to keep the PI going. So like I said, um, start with the accompaniment, and once you feel that's in your muscle memory, start playing around with the melody.
you know, and you, you can just like loop things and... And the more that you loop it, the more it will just become something that's just in your hand and you won't have to think about it. Because if you're trying to play the piece and reading these fingerings, you're going to have a difficult time. It's very difficult to just read the fingerings while multitasking with the, the visual of it all. There's too much information. So you simplify the information by just getting it into your right hand muscle memory and then you're just set to go. So let's just do a quick walk through the piece now. But that's, that's my big piece of advice. Obviously, I've been rambling about it. But... Uh, it really does help if it's in your hand, as opposed to trying to force it by concentration, which is just too difficult. I don't have that kind of concentration, so I'm assuming that students don't. Just make sure your hand's aligned there. So that 4-3 works. If it's not aligned, I can't reach the shape. Uh, there, I'm, yeah. You know, if you just practice it slowly, and then start looping it, it'll feel good. The right hand finger, that is. I like my fingering that I, I added in, but it does make sense. I went P M I P M I A. That's kind of an awkward change to the lower um, bass string with I though. So if you're struggling with that, feel free to just do two thumb strokes. It's not a big deal unless your tempo is really fast. My idea was that I want to keep a partial amount of that accompaniment figure and also alternate fingers through that, that figure. In retrospect, maybe it doesn't matter. Um, it's slow enough you could just, you know, repeat the thumb and it would be just fine. So try out my fingering there. But like I said, if you want to just use your thumb for the bass voice, feel free. It's not an Alberti bass figure there. So uh, whatever you do, I think is fine. thing there you know in the upper voice from bar seven measure 17 on um, I alternate the upper fingers sometimes but sometimes I don't so feel free to repeat fingers it there's quite a bit of space in between each melodic note and technically there's lots of alternation happening with the other notes that are happening there so if you find it easier just to repeat a finger that's fine so my, my big piece of advice is that I wouldn't really follow my fingering in this piece but I would definitely follow the concept fingering uh, if you're doing that, I think you'll end up with a much smoother performance and something that is co coherent of, you know, coherent, um, consistent from the beginning to the end in terms of the accompaniment sound. But the nitty gritty of exactly what finger you're using in the upper voice, I wouldn't worry too much. Um, as long as you're really listening for your legato and your tempo isn't too fast, you'll get through this piece. It's one of those funny pieces, though, is that it's pretty easy in terms of what's happening but you might end up spending some time working out the right hand fingering. So my recommendation, yeah, is to en enjoy it and get it into the hands and just have sit around and experiment with little looped figures because it, it's much easier than you think it is. It will come quite quickly if, if it's just in your hands. <laughs> 